Thank you, Debbie, Eddie, Jason, and Judge Dorsch. Thank you so much for speaking into our service already this morning. You know, I think you would be amazed at all the different ways that God speaks to us through people. Maybe even already this morning, God has spoken to you through the songs that we were singing, through the scriptures that were being read, through the devotional meditations that were shared. God can speak in some amazing ways through His people. One of my favorite worship artists is David Crowder. Several of us went about a month ago to a concert in Madisonville that he, he put on. It was really awesome. David Crowder, if you're not familiar with him, he's done a lot of uh, Christian songs like Come As You Are and I Am and uh, How He Loves. And I've, 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 he's probably one of my favorite artists. I've listened to him for years. And he really has an interesting take on worship. A few years ago, David Crowder wrote this book called Praise Habit. And it talks about every moment of our life can be spent worshiping, even in the most mundane things that we can find ways to worship God and see God in everyday occurrences. And he talks about in the early chapters of his book how he was going through this time of, of tragedy and how God used a really unusual experience to speak to him. He, he shares it like this. He says, my mom called and she said, David, something terrible has happened. And the words that followed were like bombs to me. As they came hurtling towards me through the miles of telephone wire, my muscles turned to liquid. And when she finished, I was left wilted on the floor. And God was not there. At least I could no longer find Him. And I had no idea where I could begin looking for Him again. The places that I used to frequent, I no longer trusted. In seven minutes, Everything I had thought about everything was dramatically different. Now David never really goes into what the tragedy is that he dealt with when he got that phone call. We can use our imaginations, but I think he does it on purpose. Because we've all had tragedies in our life where it felt like God had forgotten us. We've had that question where we said, God, where were you when this happened? We've had what they call a crisis of faith. It's caused us to question what we believe and what we know to be true. This is where David was. He says in seven minutes, his entire life changed. And it says that he went on for several days. And you know what it's like when you're going through a tragedy. Life isn't the same. You don't find the same joys. Food doesn't even taste good anymore. But he said that God spoke to him in a very unusual place and that he had to learn something from a Chick-fil-A sandwich. Now, I love Chick-fil-A as much as the next person. Probably a little bit more. I know, maybe not my daughter. She loves it. She can eat it any time. Now, some of y'all are probably thinking, now, why are you talking about Chick-fil-A today? It's Sunday. They're not open today. We can't go get Chick-fil-A after church. Well, I'm sorry. You can get it you know, sometime during the week if, you, if that's your thing, if you like it. But Chick-fil-A is, uh, is really... A tasty establishment, but I've never heard God speak through one of the sandwiches before. But Dave Crowder said that that's where he heard God. And this is what he says. He says, while he was sitting there in his depression, he lifted up in the bun, and there was a part of the sandwich that just wasn't right. It was, you know, it had gotten soaked in the grease, and it had gotten burnt, and it just, you know, it wasn't the part you wanted to eat. So he lifted the bun, he took it, and he peeled that bad part off put it in his wrapper, wadded it up, threw it away, put his sandwich back together, and took a bite, and it, he realized that what he was now eating was good. It was what was intended. He had to remove the bad from the sandwich and get rid of it in order to enjoy the good. And this is how he describes it. He says, In a small, decisive moment, I was aware of what was good. And I took effort to peel away that what, what wasn't. And in the process, I became re-enamored with the giver of good. I remembered our beginnings, 
when the statement, it was good, was first uttered. I thought about how bad was never intended. And then things started to come to life. He realized that the bad part of the sandwich was not the intended part of the sandwich. Just as when God created this universe, He called everything good. Bad was not God's intention and His plan, but because of sin, bad came into the world. And so that little moment of peeling the bad away and enjoying the good helped him to see the giver of all that was good. Now God spoke to him through that experience at Chick-fil-A. And God uses David to speak to many other people, thousands of people, through his music and through his books. And maybe there's people in your life that God is using to speak in unique ways to you this morning. I believe that he can. I believe that God uses those relationships we have to speak truth into our lives. And today we're going to explore what that might look like for us. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are constantly speaking. That you speak through us in all situations. And that we can know you. Please help us to see. Help us to remove the voices that are not you. The things that distract us and the things that pull us away from your truth. And help us to, through your word and through your spirit, hear you. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I am convinced that every relationship we have has a purpose. That people are in our lives for a reason and for a season. If you think back of the people that made an impact in your life, guys, I'm getting a lot of feedback in you just turn the monitor off if you can. If you think back to the people that made the biggest impact on your life, they might have only been there for a short period of time, for a reason and a season. Maybe they're still in your life. Maybe they're still in your life. Maybe you've been blessed to have them in your life for a long period of time. Whatever it is, I believe that God has a reason and a season for it. Proverbs Chapter 17, verse 17 says this. A friend is always loyal, and a brother is born to help in time of need. God puts those people in our lives. I can think of several people that if they weren't in my life, I don't think I would be here today. Either as a Christian or as a person living because of these people that help steer me on the right path. So people that were in your life, think back. Who has made an impact on your life? What are the voices that have spoken life to you, have spoken truth into your life, have made you the person that you are today? Think about those people. Can you think of one right now? One person who God used to guide you on his path, to bring you to this point here, to make you the person you are today. Was it something they said that stuck with you? Was it an experience was it an experience that you had with them? Thank you. Was it an experience? <laughs> we'll figure this out. It was trial and error, right? Was it an experience? <laughs> was it an experience that you had with them? Or was it just that relationship that made a huge impact on you? on your life. <laughs> Whatever it was, they changed you. And God used them for that purpose. Several years ago, when Lindsay and I were in college, and we were dating, it got to the point where it seemed like every single one of our friends was getting married except us. Maybe you've been through that experience, where it's like all your friends, usually happens in your early 20s, you know, all your friends are getting married, they're all going off, they're starting families, and you're just there. Well, that's kind of the way we were. We were stuck, not stuck, we were in college. But we felt like God was telling us, you need to wait. You need to wait for my time. We, we knew we were going to get married at this point. We were dating through high school. And we just felt like, okay, we need to wait on the Lord. We don't need to rush this. We need to wait for His opening, His timing. Well, we had friends left and right that were getting married. 
And it's like, okay, you know, they, they're our age, they've been together for a while. But it starts to weigh on you. And I remember one yeah. Sunday morning at church, we went to our home church in Kentucky, and the minister got up and he announced that his son had just gotten engaged. His son, who was 18 years old, had just gotten engaged to his fiance, who was also 18. And here we are in our early 20s, still, still felt like we needed to wait. And we were happy for them. They were friends of ours. We were glad to hear that they were engaged. But we couldn't help but have sort of a weight of sadness that we carried with us. And, you know, it, it, sometimes you just leave church sad. And we did. We walked out that door, and we both kind of hung our heads, and we walked out to the car, and it felt like God had maybe forgotten about and I remember this lady from the church, this lady named Jill, she was the youth minister's wife. She'd never done anything like this for us before. But she chased us down in the church parking lot as we were almost to our car. And she said, I want to let you know that you are honoring God by being patient and waiting for Him. Don't let these other things bother you. You do what God's led you to do. And it was one of those moments where I felt like God had sent a direct message to us. In the course of like two minutes, I went from being completely down and depressed and feeling like God had left us to being uplifted and feeling certain that God had remembered us and was guiding us because of the words that Jill spoke to us that day. And I'll never forget that. And it was such a unique occurrence, but God used her encouragement to speak to us that day. And I hope we have those kinds of encouraging voices in our lives. That we have the voices that are speaking truth and speaking life to us, that are pointing us towards God. We'll try this again. All right. I think there are a couple of different types of voices that we have in our lives. I think we have intentional voices and unintentional voices in our lives. Intentional and unintentional voices. And what are those? Well, an intentional voice is someone that you allow in your life. This is that family member that you speak with constantly, that best friend that you share everything with, that you get advice from. These are teachers that you respect and look up to. These are maybe your preacher or other preachers that you listen to, mentors. Maybe it's a favorite author that you constantly read what they write. Maybe it's a favorite musician or singer or artist, like I mentioned earlier with David Crowder. Maybe it's a favorite TV or radio program that you always tune into. Maybe it's the people that you follow on social media. Whoever it is, these are the people that you want in your life speaking to you either one-on-one -on -one or by following their example. You choose to put them in your life. And what's important for us to remember with these intentional voices is that we need to make sure that they are directing us towards God, that they are not distracting us, that they're not putting false ideas in our mind. So we should ask ourselves, is this voice honoring God? Is it lined up with what the Bible tells me about God, about myself, about our world, and about the things that are truly important. Because if the intentional voices that are in our lives are not pointing us towards Christ, they're pointing us somewhere else, away from Him. So we need to think about that. Then you have the unintentional voices. These are the things that speak into your life, but you don't really want them there, maybe. Or you didn't intend for them to be there. Maybe it's a negative critic. Maybe it's a memory of something that you did in the past that haunts you. Maybe it's a broken relationship that's long since been apart, but the words that were said, the impact of that relationship still speaks to you. Maybe you were bullied as a kid or in high school, and that self-image that you got as a young person still goes with you today. Maybe it's the, the words that you'll never forget. Maybe it's a positive thing. Maybe it's something that your mom, your dad, your grandma, your grandpa, that they just instilled in you, and you can hear that voice in your head 
every single day. These are the unintentional voices in our lives. And these are really important. That we make sure that they are aligned with God's word. That they are pointing us towards Christ. Because so many times those things are not. They weigh us down. They distract us. They pull us away. So God does speak through many different types of people in many different ways. But not every voice is from God. This is where we need to discern. This is where we need to know the Word of God. We need to be able to see if what is being spoken is true. So let's talk about for a few minutes now how God uses people to speak. Well, one way throughout Scripture is through prophecy. Prophecy. And what is prophecy? Well, in its very basic term, prophecy is speaking God's Word. And there was two different types of prophecy. There was foretelling God's Word and forthtelling God's Word. And what does that mean? Foretelling means speaking the future. You are foretelling the events that are going to happen. God has given you a message to speak to Him, to speak to the people. Forthtelling is telling what God's Word is, what His message is for today. I am giving you this message for you right now. I'm not predicting the future. I'm not telling things that are going to happen. This is the message for you right now. Foretelling and forthtelling God's Word. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says, Long ago, and many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom He also created the world. So what does that tell us? God used prophets as his main vehicle of speaking to the world in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament times. But in these last days, he has spoken to us directly through his Son, through Jesus Christ. So the word of Christ has replaced the, the role of the word of the prophets in our lives. So what that means is divine revelation, new divine revelation, new words from God are complete in the Word of God, in the Bible. The Bible is the complete revelation of God that He's given to us. So, if you have someone that says, I'm a prophet, and I have a new message from God, beware. Because Revelation tells us that we cannot add to or take away from this book of prophecy. So many cults have started by saying that this prophet so-and-so got a new message from God and decided to start a new church. It doesn't happen. God speaks to us through His Word. But, in a sense, in the very literal sense of the word prophecy, it does still occur. Foretelling God's Word. Anytime you read the Scripture, you are reading God's Word. And anytime you speak the Scripture to someone, just as we've done several times here this morning, we are literally reading the Word of God, then we are, in a sense, prophesying because we're speaking God's Word. Now, me right now, as I'm talking, I'm not prophesying. I'm not a prophet. Don't, you know, don't say, Scott said he's a prophet. No, I'm not a prophet. But anyone, when you're reading the Word of God in a very literal sense, you're reading prophecy, God's Word to us. Whatever God's Word is proclaimed, that is prophecy. Forth telling. Telling it for the people for the day. Just be careful that the one who's proclaiming the message is not proclaiming their <coughs> own message, but the Word of God. Another way that God speaks to us through people is to provide greater understanding to a situation. There's a story in the book of Exodus. Right after Moses had led the Israelites out of Egypt and into the wilderness, that he was managing all the affairs of the people. And some scholars say that it would be around 2.4 million people that one man was managing all the affairs over. And so from dusk till dawn, and dawn till dusk, Moses sat and judged over the people of Israel. And people would wait all day long, all day long, to see Moses and get a judgment on their situation. Any of you that were participating in the Build-A-Bear thing a, a few weeks ago, and they heard about all the lines, now they had to shut down because they were wrapped around the inside of them all? It's kind of like that sort of situation, but worse. Because these people wanted his judgment on their affairs. <coughs> so Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, comes to see him, and he, he witnesses all this. He says, this isn't good. 
In fact, this is what he says, Exodus chapter 18, verses 17 and 18. Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you're doing is not good. You and the people will certainly wear yourselves out. For this thing is too heavy for you. You're not able to do it alone. Sometimes we get so stuck in a situation that we can't see what's right in front of us. We don't see the big picture. We don't see the problems that are ahead. We need an outside voice to help provide better understanding to us. And this is what God provided through Jethro. He told him, this isn't good the way you're doing these things. This is too much for you. So he gives him this advice. You need to train more men to be judges over the different affairs of the people and divide them out into smaller groups. It picks up in verse 22. And let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter then they will bring to you, but the small matters they will decide for themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will not bear, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you, and you will be able to endure. And all this, people will also go to their own place in peace. So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did just what he said. God provided better understanding for Moses, a better way to manage a problem, how to do things. And he did what he said, and it worked. It was a blessing to him. In fact, this is right before Moses goes up to the mountain and spends 40 days talking to God and receiving the law, the Ten Commandments. Do you think Moses would have been able to do that if he was still in the midst of judging day and night over every affair of the people? God used this so that he could further speak to him, so he could reveal more of himself to him. God uses people to help us gain greater understanding. And this all opens the doors for us to learn more from him. The next way that God speaks to us is he uses people to accurately explain the truth of Jesus. God uses people to help us know Jesus more. Now, last week we talked about the relationship that Paul had with Aquila and Priscilla. How it was just this coincidence that their circumstances brought them together. It wasn't really a coincidence. God brought them together. In Acts chapter 18, we learn that one of the purposes is for Aquila and Priscilla to impact the lives of future leaders of the church. Acts 18, verse 24. Now, there was a Jew named Apollos who was a native of Alexandria. He came to Ephesus and was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he only knew the baptism of John. Now, Apollos was a gifted speaker, a strong leader, a very intelligent man who God was using for his kingdom, but he didn't have all the information. He only knew the baptism of John which was a baptism of repentance. It wasn't in the name of Jesus. It wasn't to receive the Holy Spirit. It wasn't for new life. It was to repent of sins. And so this is what happens. He's there, and Aquila and Priscilla reach out to him and mentor him. Verse 26. Apollos began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he was finished, he crossed over to Achaia, and the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those through grace and believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. Apollos needed better understanding. You could be in church your whole life and still not know everything. We never will. I, even when we get to heaven, I think there's just the vastness of God. I can't imagine that any of us would be able to fully, 100% understand Him, let alone here on earth in our limited bodies. But we will reveal more when we get to heaven. So Apollos needed to learn more about Jesus. And that empowered him to make a great impact for the gospel. He was well on his way with his faith. But God used Aquila and Priscilla to speak into his life and show him Jesus. And the next thing that we want to look at is that God uses people to encourage one another. <clears throat> Hebrews 3 verse 13 says, But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. 
God wants us to be speaking life to each other. Well, to speak encouragement, to encourage us away from sin, to pursuing Him. This is not a journey that we can do on our own. We need those godly voices in our lives helping us. And you know what? That's exactly what the church is for. Because God speaks the clearest through His church. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. When we come together as the church, one of our purposes is to build one another up, to have fellowship with one another, to encourage, to strengthen, to share burdens, to point people towards Christ, to encourage one another. God speaks the clearest through His people, through the preaching and teaching of the Word, through studying God's Word together, through praying together, lifting one another up, sharing one another's burdens, going to the hospital with one another, helping one another, serving with one another, worshiping together, sharing life together. That is the purpose of the church. And look what happens when each church member is doing their part to speak God's message. Ephesians 4, verses 15 and 16. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, that's Christ, from whom the whole body is joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly. I highlighted that on purpose. Makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. The good purpose that God has for His church is to build one another up in love, to speak truth into your life, to encourage you to follow Him more closely. But the key is that each part needs to be working properly. I am not so naive to know that there are some deep hurts that come from churches. And maybe you've been hurt by the church before. That is not the church working properly. That is like that piece of the Chick-fil-A sandwich that needed to get ripped off and wrapped up and thrown away. That is not the good intention of the church. God's good intention is for us to be one body united together lifting one another up and pursuing Christ together. Amen. Drawing near to Him. That is the good purpose of the church. So, we each have a role. If you are a part of the body of Christ, which simply means you are a Christian, you have a responsibility. It's a challenge <laughs> that each one of us can take. We each have a part to play in pursuing Christ and encouraging others by speaking the truth in love and growing together because whether you realize it or not we are all speaking a message your life your attitude your actions your words all speak a message do they speak a message of faith do they speak a message of hope do they speak a message of encouragement what does your life speak first peter chapter 4 verse 10 as each has received a gift, let us use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. I love that phrase, very grace. The grace that you received is different from the grace that you received, the grace you received, and you received, and you received, and I received. We've all received God's grace in our lives through our experiences, through the things that we've learned, and we can use that to make a difference in someone else's life. We've been given a gift so it can be used to serve one another. There are no bench warmers in the kingdom of God. Everyone has a role to play. So I just want to close by asking, what's your gift? How has God blessed you with His grace? How has God made an impact on your life? And how are you using it to make an impact on others? Because when the church is working together, when the church is working properly, nothing can stand against it. The gates of heaven and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. 
Jesus said there is power when His people are working together. So what are you speaking? How are you using your gift? Let's pray. Lord, we do thank You that You speak through us and You speak to us through the people that are in our lives, the voices that we have every single day. God, may we shut out the voices of negativity, the voices that distract us, the voices that cause us to pursue things that do not honor You. And may we hear clearly Your voice. So God, we need encouragement. We need strength. We need to rely on You. God, may You please provide that for us. And then may this church be a church that lifts one another up, that pursues truth in love. And may Your grace abound all the more. We pray all these things in Jesus' name.